Hello, everyone. Um, we stopped with um, Metroids last time. Are there any questions before I start a new topic? Yeah, yeah, unit time scheduling, the example that we had. No question? Oh, yeah, there's a question. Um, did anyone see them? I thought I uploaded the latest. You didn't? In both? I mean, I typically upload both, but you didn't see in neither the, because they're usually in sync, the Keller and the Thomas. Oh, yeah. I'll double check. I thought I'd, I uploaded. It's like one file that usually contains everything. So I'll, I'll check once I'm back. Any other question? <clears throat> then I'll start a new topic, um, which will be, I think, no, the second last example of a greedy algorithm. Um, and we, and this is, this is um, an greedy algorithm, algorithm that helps you in finding um, satisfying assignments to Boolean variables in certain kinds of Boolean formulas, such that you can solve um, puzzles that, that reads, for example, like this. I wrote it down. So, for example, Mr. Smith has a dog. Uh, Mrs. Brown has a cat. And if Mr. Jones has a dog, then he also has a cat. And if Mr. Smith has a dog and Mr. Jones has a cat, then Mr. Peacock also has a dog. And if um, Mrs. Brown and Mr. Jones have a pet of the same species, then Mr. Smith has a cat and all men have dogs. So this is, uh, you know, the, the kind of puzzles. And then the question is, for example, does Mrs. Brown really have a cat or a dog? Um, or do, we have, do they have the same species? Um, and these kind, of, these kind of puzzles you can formalize in a, in a Boolean variable where you use the variables to express such a knowledge. And we will see how you can use horn formulas to represent such knowledge and where you can uh, derive conclusions that might not be immediately obvious just from what I've just uh, read. Okay, so this uh, is the framework uh, of so-called horn formulas. So, I mean, today after class, after the first class, I got some questions concerning Boolean formulas. Have you uh, ever seen a Boolean formulas with Boolean variables and logical ands and ors? Yeah, I thought so, so I was a bit surprised. Then I will assume that you have seen it, but uh, I won't make many assumptions about this. So here are uh, so-called horn formulas. These are special types of uh, Boolean formulas. Uh, you know that Boolean formulas are composed of uh, Boolean variables, such as X, that can take on a value of true or false, which I simply denote by T and F. And then a Boolean formula would look, for example, like this. You have positive and negative occurrences of variables in this formula, which are called in this context in literals. You have X as a positive literal and Y. Uh, so I'm, I'm denoting the negative of Y with this bar on top. So I'm saying X and not Y. So Y is a negative literal of, of variable Y. And then I have uh, implications and uh, have uh, also logical ORs, which I indicate by the symbol here. So just uh, for completeness, this is a logical AND, this is an OR, and this is an implication. So this is a uh, how a general Boolean formula looks like. The one we are interested in today are horn formulas. They have a very specific structure. The horn formulas are 
simply lists of Boolean formulas of the of a very specific form. So a list of uh, Boolean formulas. In this context, we call them clauses. which come in two forms. They can be so-called implications. Implication has uh, all positive literal, literal, uh, literals uh, connected with logical ends on the left-hand side. So we have something like x1 to 1 and x2 and so on until xn. And uh, implication y. So this is how implications look like in whole formulas. We have all positive literal, li literals, so much easier after and before lunch. Uh, so all positive uh, literals um, that we connect through ends the left-hand side of this implica uh, uh, implication, and we have a single positive literal on the right-hand side. Such as shown above here. So these are implications. And the second type of clause we will have in Horn formulas are so called negative clauses, which are simply um, negative occurrences of variables connected through ORs. So these are called negative clauses. through logical ORs, and they're all negative. This is how negative clauses look like. All negative literals connected through ORs. So this negative clause could express something like they don't have, have they don't have all dogs, they don't all have dogs. Yeah. No, it's just that it's just ors. So given a list of clauses that are all either implications or negative clauses, the goal. is to find values of the variables, true and false assignment to all variables that makes it evaluated true, that makes all the clauses in your Horn formula, formula evaluated true. Find values of all variables at uh, makes all clauses in this formula evaluates to true or report that you can't. This is what's called a satisfying assignment. The setup clear to everyone? No, sorry, I'll give an example. <clears throat>
let's say you're given the following two clauses. First one is an implication. that x and y uh, imply z and you have a negative clause which says not x or not w and say that in this example we set all variables to false w is false x is false y is false and set is false. Then what can we say about our clauses? What about the first clause? Any idea? Is it true or false? True, right? And the second one. False. So that this clause says that um, at least one of the two variables has to be false, and we set both to false, x and y, so we're fine. And that's why this will evaluate to um, true. So this is a positive example, very easy solution. Uh, a negative example would be the following. So here's a let's call this a counter example. where such a satisfying assignment um, doesn't exist. So let's say we're given following clauses, y uh, implies x, and we have not x as one negative clause, and we have an implication that doesn't have anything on the left-hand side. So an empty clause always evaluates to uh, true. Looks a bit strange, but it still makes sense. So how about this? What do we do here? We can start with the same idea. We can start by setting X to false. So if you look at the middle, middle neg negative clause, we know we have to set X to false to get the middle clause true. So X will be false. The third clause tells us that true implies y, that means we have to set y equal true in this case, so we don't have a choice. And now if I go back and look at the first clause, which says y equal x, so true implies, no, not, sorry, not, not equal, that true implies uh, x and x equal false. You can see that this is not satisfied because it really says that true implies false. And this, of course, is false. So here, no such satisfying assignment exists, or at least we couldn't find one, and we will see in a minute that uh, actually there is no satisfying assignment for this particular case. Yeah. The, in the first example, it says what? That x and y are z. Like, I think you, you don't say Z in the US, right? You say Z. Yeah, so left hand side evaluates the false, that's why you don't care about the right hand side. Yeah. Up. Yeah. So who says Z? Is anyone saying Z to Z? How do you pronounce the letter Z? You're using Z or C, okay. I won't try because I can't really somehow distinguish the Cs from the Z, so I'll stick to the Z. So whenever I said Z, then just remember what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, so this is a counter example. And, and so the way we try to solve this counter example gives an idea for an algorithm, more specifically for a greedy algorithm. Because if you keep in mind that we have two types of clauses, we have negative clauses and we have these implications, then we could be greedy and try to say, let's satisfy all the negative clauses first. And how could you do that? How could you satisfy all negative clauses first in a very trivial solution? Because all variables occur in a, in a negative literal, 
you can simply set everything to false, right? So if you set every variable to false, then all negative clauses will be satisfied. So this is the sort of the, the first greedy step. And then you only have to worry about the second type of uh, clause, namely the implications, and some of them might be false. And that's why I could try to find impl implications that are sort of uh, currently false and try to, to satisfy them by setting the right hand side to true. So in this sense, the two kinds of clauses will draw you sort of in opposite directions because the negative clauses will encourage you to set everything to, to negative values or to false. And implications will force you to set some of these variables to true. They do this because the only way an implication can be false is if the left-hand side is true, but the right-hand side is false. And the right-hand side is always a single variable in horn formulas. So you only have to set this one variable on the right-hand side to true, and you're making that implication also happy. Okay. And this is uh, the entire idea really for this algorithm. So we start with the setting everything to false. Then we only set uh, to true if we really have to by uh, certain uh, implications. So only set T, I mean true. You need to. You need to if uh, an implication says that you need to. Okay, then let's write down the, this, the idea of this algorithm, which will be our greedy horn. So the input to this algorithm is a horn formula. And you initially set all the variables To false. And then you're checking all the implications if they're satisfied because the negative clauses will, will be satisfied after that first initialization. So you only worry about implications. So while an implication is not satisfied under the current assignment, you simply set the right-hand side of that implication to true. So this is the only way really to, to satisfy uh, an implication that is not satisfied. You simply set the right-hand side, which is a single variable, a single positive variable, you set it to true. And so once you're done with that while loop, so if you can't find any implication anymore that is not satisfied, meaning all implications are satisfied, now, you essentially go back to the negative clauses and check if your negative clauses are still all satisfied. Now, if all negative clauses are true, and you simply return this assignment. And if not, so if not all of the negative clauses are satisfied after this while loop, then you can return that it cannot, this, this uh, foreign formula cannot be satisfied.
but we have to check only the because we made uh, sure that I mean the while loop will only terminate if we can't find any implication anymore that is not satisfied. Right. So in this previous while loop, we scan for implications that are not satisfied, and then if they're not satisfied, we just satisfy them. And then once everything is satisfied, then we go back to the negative assignments and check back if they are still satisfied because they were satisfied in the beginning, but but they might not be anymore because you had to set some variables to positive. Yeah. So the running time, I'll just write it down. Um, we're not gonna um, look into this into more detail, but sort of the uh, naive uh, implementation would take um, n squared time if n is the, the number of literals or occurrences of literals in, in your, in your uh, horn formula. So meaning the length in terms of the number of literals because you have to scan in the worst case, order of n many uh, rounds in this while loop to, to check for violated implications. And every run or every uh, iteration of this while loop might again take order of n to scan for a violated um, implication. And that's why sort of the naive implementation, if you just scan all the implications uh, in each, in each, in each uh, iteration, will take you order n squared time. But it can be done better with a more clever implementation. You can register this actually up to overall uh, run, uh, to overall linear running time. We're not gonna look into this. So this is n squared, but can be reduced to linear time. For us, it's at this moment that not important how this is done. More important for us is uh, correctness. Why is the algorithm correct? Um, so for this, we have to think about two things. There's two possible outcomes. Um, if we return an assignment in this if uh, uh, clause, if we check that all negative clauses are true, then we know that whatever we have done is a satisfying assignment. Why? Because we have initially set all variables to false, meaning all negative uh, uh, clauses are satisfied. We only terminate this while loop when all the implications are satisfied. So all implications are satisfied at the end of this while loop. And the if basically checks if all the negative clauses are still all satisfied. And that's why we know both types of uh, implications are satisfied. So in other words, once we're terminating with uh, an assignment, if you return an assignment, it must be a satisfying assignment by the definition of the while loop and the definition of basically what we're checking for in this if, in this if clause. That part clear to everyone that if you're returning an assignment, it must be a satisfying assignment. So this is the sort of more obvious part. The second part, what we have to uh, think about is if you really return that this, uh, this uh, formula cannot be satisfied, is there really no satisfying assignment to what we have done? And uh, this can be shown through induction, which we will not do, but intuitively, I think it's very clear. Um, because in each step, you're only satisfying an implication whenever you have to. So you, it's really, it's basically, you don't have any choice whenever you set the right-hand side of, a, of an implication to true, then this is because you have to do it. And so you can show by induction that uh, any assignment, any satisfying assignment will have to do the same and set this particular variable to true. And you can say, and you can show this by induction that whenever you do this and you set more variables to true in this while loop, any satisfying assignment will have to do the same. And that means at the end, if you cannot satisfy it with your assignment, then none of, none, no assignment exists that, that can do that. So this is the high level idea of this. But this can be shown very um, easy by, by induction, but I think intuitively it makes, it makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Satis satisfying a clause means to, to that it evaluates it true. Any other questions? Then uh, let's have a look at an example. So we already saw an example, in fact, here. 
In this example, we started by setting everything to false. And this is how your greedy algorithm would start. It would set all variables to false initially. And you can see that by definition, the negative clause will be satisfied. And after checking for this, you check all the implications. And you can see that this implication is already satisfied under your current assignment. So there's nothing that you have to do in this while loop. And your while loop will terminate immediately. And you can return. And then you go back and check if. Uh, uh, the negative clauses are still satisfied, which in this case is uh, sort of meaningless because you didn't change anything. And so in the end, you obtain an assignment that looks exactly like this. And both uh, clauses will evaluate the truth. So this is sort of the uh, uh, easy example. Again, let's look at a sort of a more complex and, and negative example. So let's say uh, we consider the following clauses. We have uh, an empty implication. And we have a negative clause saying that's not X or not Y. And we have another implication that says X uh, implies Y. So here we have one negative clause and uh, two implications. And let's see how, what our greedy algorithm would do. Here's our two variables, X and Y. And Let's have a look at uh, the first assignment. So we will start by setting both variables to false, X and Y. So this is what we do initially. And then we know that the negative clause will be satisfied, of course, since we set everything to, um, let's do this differently. Will be true. And X impl uh, implication Y is still true because X is false and that's why we don't care about Y. So this is also true. And we have to check all the implications. So the last implication, if you check it, it will say that true, the empty um, uh, conjunction here is evaluates the true. So true implies X and it means that, uh, and X is false. So true implies false is false. And that's why this clause here This clause, let me try this down here, will be false. Okay, so then our greedy algorithm tells us to scan for these implications that are currently false and make them uh, true. And the only way to do this, we said, is to set the right hand side to true. So in this case, we have to set X equal true. So this is the second attempt. We're setting um, X equal true and we remain Y equal false. Then this will make this first implication true and it will make the, and our negative clause is still true because Y is false. And so no, not Y is true. And uh, our implication, now will the second implication now will turn false because we have set uh, y equal false even though x is true. So now the second implication will become uh, false. Then we continue. So in our greedy scheme, we would scan for the next implication that is false um, and set the right hand side to true. So in this case, that means that we also have to set y equal true. And then this will make our second um, clause true. So our second implication. And the first implication can change really by setting something to true if it was true before. So now we're done basically with the, with the while loop. We have scanned all the implications. We see that all implications are true. So now we have to go back to our uh, negative clause 
And what we will see is that now suddenly all this, all the variables in this negative clause will be evaluating to false, and therefore the entire clause is false. And so based on our algorithm, now after checking all the negative clauses or after first satisfying all the implications, um, we can see that both are true now. This is what we did in the while loop. And afterwards, we check the negative clause, we see it's false. So the if tells us that we cannot satisfy this, uh, this one formula. And this is what we conclude. So in this case, we cannot satisfy this formula. Any questions? So this was our the last uh, positive or purely positive example of a greedy algorithm. Again, very efficient linear time to find such a satisfying assignment. Very intuitive also. And uh, now I want to show you sort of the last uh, setup for a greedy algorithm, where we will not be able to find an optimal solution using greedy, but the good news is that we can still get a solution that is not too far away from, from the optimal solution. So this, in this sense, it's sort of a different flavor of a, pro, of a greedy problem compared to what we have discussed so far. And this is called set cover. The set cover is a very, very old uh, uh, problem and it has tons of applications in all fields that you can possibly think of, including again, computational biology, we have used sort of a set cover model to once um, find single cells that represent sort of a single cell data set accurately. In this example, we will do ver something very similar, except that uh, instead of single cells, we're looking at towns in a county and try to pick sort of instead of representative cells, we're trying to pick towns in which we want to place fire station in the cheapest possible way, as we will see. So the formal setup of set cover is the following. You're given a set B in this context, very often called uh, the universe, and you have N subsets of B. That I will denote by S1 to Sn. So these are all subsets of your universe B. And the output is a selection of the subsets S that covers B. So you want to find, um, you want to select certain subsets such, subsets such that the union of all your selected subsets will cover the entire universe B. And you want to do this in the cheapest possible way, meaning that you want to do this with the fewest sets possible. Okay, so let me write this down while you're thinking about it. So the output is a selection of subsets noted by I, which will contain sets SI1 to SIM. such that the union of all these sets Sij, J from one through M is equal to B. Okay, so you wanna pick subsets among your subsets S that's together uh, cover the entire universe B. And as I said, you wanna do this with uh, as few as the fewest uh, sets possible. You want to minimize the cardinality of I, meaning the number of selected subsets.
Okay, is this uh, good so far, the setup of set cover? Okay, and now we, we look at an example where we uh, set up the infrastructure for our county. We have a certain uh, a set of towns in this county and we wanna decide where to place fire stations and which towns we wanna uh, set uh, fire stations. Um, and you want to make sure that, well, on the one hand, you want to set fire stations only within towns. Uh, and the second constraint is that every city has to be within 30 miles of any fire station. So no city should be too far away from, from any uh, fire station. Okay, let me draw this in the picture. So let's, let's say that we have the following towns on the following virtual map. Uh, label these uh, towns. These are our towns in the county. And we said we wanted to have uh, no town too far away from a, from a fire station. Let's say it should be within 30 miles. I'm not sure if this is realistic. Let's say 30 miles just to have a scale here. Looks roughly like this. So this is a ball of uh, radius 30 miles. want to have these fire stations within 30 miles of any town. Okay, so then first step by now, um, this is probably what you would do intuitively. You try to capture this information in a graph. So the graph vertices will be the, uh, the, the towns and we will draw an edge now between two cities whenever these two cities or towns are within 30 miles. So based on the size of this, uh, all these three cities would uh, lie close to each other, uh, A and G. Yeah, with some fantasy, probably two. These towns here would be within 30 miles. And these ones, that's one. Got anything? No. So this is uh, capturing the information of whether two cities are close enough to each other, meaning within 30 miles. And so the question is now, which towns do we pick to place the fire stations in? Okay, so I gave you now two problems. The first one is, you know, having some towns and selecting towns to place some fire station within a certain uh, distance. And the, and the second problem I gave you is more um, sort of a mathematical framework which describes the set cover uh, problem. 
Now the question is, how can you capture this fire station problem as a set cover instance? Does anyone see that? How you can model this problem of finding towns in which you want to set fire station as a set cover instance? Any, any suggestions how you would do that? Can you what? Sorry, the, I didn't get it. This joint sets of what? So are you trying to describe sets in your set cover instance? Because to, I mean, let's do, let's start from the beginning. So to define set cover instance, the first thing you need to define is B. So your universe. So what is, what is B? Yeah, all this, all the cities or towns in our county, exactly. And then can you describe again? Maybe I didn't get it. Which sets would you have? Um, close. I mean, it's not any connected component. It's it's it should be. Or any other suggestions? Because if you look at a connected component, two nodes might not be directly connected, so they might be very far away from each other. But the idea is, I mean, think about it the other way around. If you now decide to place a fire station in city B. Then uh, what did you gain? The D, yeah, but yeah, and A actually too, yeah, and and B itself exactly. So whenever you set, you, you, whenever you decide to place a fire station within a town, you have covered um, all the towns that are connected to that particular town in the sense that all these towns are close enough to that fire station. And that's basically what you do for, this is basically your candidate set. So for, you can pick the sets of, uh, of towns that are, that is implied by any city in this graph. And then you try to find the minimum subset or the minimum selection of these subsets to cover all towns in your, in your county. Okay, so uh, here's an example, or I, I will just list a few of those. So in this example, we will have set B equal to, well, all the towns. And we have different sets. SA, for example, will contain all the towns that we would cover if we decide to place a fire station in town A, so which would be A, B, and B, K, H, and I, uh, and E. Did we get any? And uh, SB, so the towns that you would cover with a fire station in B would be B itself. B, C, and A. Okay, and so on up down to SK, which would include towns A, I mean K, A, H, I, and J. Okay, so this is uh, now. Does everyone see that this is solving our problem? That this set cover really, if you find an optimal solution, so this set cover instance, you will have sort of a smallest set of uh, towns where we can place fire stations. So how would you do it? How would you solve this? Think really again. Which town would you pick first? Bank. Yeah, in this case, in this example, this would be, which town would it be? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, 
five, six. So A has one, two, three, four. No, it's also five. So we could pick A or I in this case. But let's pick A because I'm not sure my counter example will run through with I. A has six. Oh yeah, one, two, okay. And I has one, two, three, four, four. Okay, no, it's four versus six. Okay, yeah, you're right. So we actually have to pick A. I think we don't have any other node with uh, six neighbors. Okay, so in this particular example, we pick uh, town A because it has the most neighbors. That means if you select A and place a fire station, here in A, I just note this by the star. Then we will have covered cities A, B, E, K, I, H, and E. Okay, and which city would you uh, pick next? And why? Yeah, F would cover two cities. G, the same, uh, but if you picked C or, or J, we would cover only one city. So to be greedy, we would pick uh, F or J, and in this case, you would cover the, the other city as well. Let's say we pick F, and this will also cover G. And uh, next we have, we can choose really, in both cases, we only have to, we only can cover one additional city. So we pick C, which will be also covered. And then we pick finally D, uh, sorry, I, uh, J, which will be also covered. So after selecting four towns, we put, uh, where we place fire stations, we have covered all cities. So all cities are close enough to our fire station. And we needed, or we required four such towns. So we need, or four fire stations really. Let's quickly write down what we did, just in a, so this, this, this algorithm is really, it's really a, a one-liner. Again, it's a very intuitive, greedy algorithm. Maybe in the meantime, you can uh, think about whether this is the best solution in this particular example, or if you find a better one. So on the greedy heuristic, what we did, we chose the next subset, always based on the number of uncovered cities. So is four optimal in this case? No. What's a better solution? Just said no because I told you that this is an, a counter example where greed is not optimal. Three, yeah. Any suggestion? Oh, you can't see it anymore. So what three towns would be, would be a good solution here? So H would cover the whole thing at the left, lower left, and you said C? Yeah, H covers A. The upper left, yeah, and then, yeah, correct, yeah. So this would cover, um, all the entire graph is just three, or the entire county was just three fire stations. And intuitively, what went wrong is that we were greedy in the first step, picking A, and this A sort of made everything bad for us. So there's no optimal solution that really contains A. So this really, uh, this uh, really choice property is violated here. And we could never recover really and uh, got a suboptimal solution. So write, uh, write down a, a counter example on which one is optimal. So this is, uh, in this case, greed is not optimal. And uh, an example would be, say, he said SH, I think. And 
and SC and any of the other, let's say E. So this is the first example of a greedy algorithm that we found now or that we saw in class where we don't get the optimal solution. But as I said before, is, uh, we will be able to show that this solution is not too bad, that the four is not too bad uh, or not too far away from the optimal solution in this case, in this case three. Um, and we do this by the following theorem. So I can write this properly. So say that the cardinality of our set B, our universe uh, is N. Then uh, let's say that the optimal solution to this problem uses some K sets. Then uh, one can show that this greedy heuristic that we just discussed will give us a solution. Uh, a solution that uses at most k times ln n many sets in this particular example fire stations so ln n is the natural logarithm to, to base e uh, and this is what we call in this context the uh, approximation factor so ln n in this case is the approximation factor Okay, so whatever instance you give me, if I run greedy, I will never be further away than a factor of ln n compared to the optimal solution. And in our case, if you plug in the numbers from our previous example, what that means, just to get a feeling for these numbers, what happened now? Um, So if in the previous case, the optimal solution was three, k equal three, and we had n equal 11 uh, cities, then uh, three times ln n, ln 11 is equal to something like 7.19. And this is an important thing to see. The approximation guarantee doesn't tell us exactly what we will get, but only what we We'll get in the worst case or will sort of bounce how, how, how bad it could be but in practice we can see very often that the solution is actually much better than this worst case so this uh, this theorem tells us that in this fire station uh, instance we will find a solution that is at most a factor of 7.19 far away from three and in fact in our case it was actually just uh, four so we had just uh, four cities instead of three And uh, this is a very um, simple to show theorem. So let's uh, prove this one theorem. Because it's, it's mostly based on um, an insight about the greedy algorithm, basically one property, and otherwise it's just repeatedly applying the same insights uh, plus some standard calculus that gives you this, uh, this theorem. So let's say, and this proof, what we really consider is uh, the number of elements that you have not covered by the greedy algorithm in a certain iteration. So the number of elements not covered by greedy at iteration t, this is what we call nt. Okay. After, after t iteration, you'll check uh, how many towns don't are not covered yet by fire stations, and this is your nt. And sort of the the the, the critical the critical insight here is that if you look at the optimal solution, the optimal solution contains k sets, and these k sets, of course, also have to cover your nt elements that you have not covered yet, and so at least one of these sets in the optimal solution has to cover 
at least nt over k many of those elements by just an averaging argument, right? So that we just take the average and there must exist one set among this optimal k sets that contains at least that number of elements. Otherwise you would never be able to, if they're all strictly smaller than nt over k, uh, they couldn't cover all nt elements together. Okay, so these uh, remaining elements, the NT remaining elements, they are covered by an optimal solution that uses K sets. And so some optimal set must have size uh, greater or equal than NT over K. So let's just write this down. What this statement says is that n t minus one, sorry, in the n t plus one, so the number of elements that will be uncovered in the next iteration can be at most n t, the number of elements uncovered in the previous iteration, minus. And t over k. Why? Because the previous sentence told us that the optimal solution must contain one set that contains at least this number of elements. And since greedy is always picking the one with the largest number of uncovered elements, it will cover at least that number of elements in that one iteration. This is basically what you're subtracting from the uncovered elements. So going from iteration t to t plus one, you will have to subtract at least n t minus k elements that you have covered with your uh, new sets. Okay, just rewriting this. It's the same as just saying n t times one minus one over k. Okay, this is uh, the the main insight here. And then we simply repeat this argument multiple times. So we start from nt, nt, which we said is at most nt minus 1 times 1 minus 1 over k. Then we can apply the same arguments to nt minus 1. And if you go back one iteration, we know that this one will be bounded by nt minus 2 times 1 uh, minus 1 over k squared. And we keep on doing this until we reach n0, which we then have to multiply with 1 minus 1 over k uh, to the power of t. And n0 is the number of elements that we started with. This is simply n. So we have n times 1 minus 1. Okay the power of t. Now using some standard uh, calculus, we can bound this final term by the following, and we're using the following fact, namely that one minus x is smaller or equal than e to the power of, of minus x. Just uh, try to visualize these two functions where you have a uh, function one minus x, it will lie below e uh, to the power of minus x and they're equal only for x equals zero. 
which one over k won't won't be. So using this fact, we can uh, plug it in and bound it in the following way. And in fact, we can strictly bound it from above. It's not not greater, a smaller or equal, but we can say actually that is strictly smaller, strictly smaller than just plugging in this n times e to the minus one over k to the power of t, which is the same as n times e to the power of minus t over k. Okay, so now we have strictly upper bounded the number of remaining elements of the iteration t. And when does our algorithm term terminate? When that number drops to below zero, uh, to below one. So meaning if there's less than one element uncovered, nothing is uncovered really, then the algorithm will terminate. Okay. And when does this happen? So whenever the right-hand side here, this term is equal to one or smaller, So if nt is strictly smaller than one, then the, the, the algorithm terminates. And when, is, when is this the case? Whenever n times e to the power of minus t over k is equal to one. based on our bound here on the top, which is uh, what I'm using to bound and T. And so this is the same as saying E to the power of minus T over K equal one over N. So this is just a, a very standard uh, transformation now. I take the natural logarithm. This is where it comes from here in, the, in this approximation guarantee which uh, leaves one minus two over K equal LN one over N. And that means nothing else that T is equal to minus K times LN one over N, which is the same as K LN. So this tells us when this algorithm will terminate because nothing is, uh, is left uncovered. It will terminate after k times ln n, or at most k times ln n iterations. And in each iteration, we have added one set. So in the end, we will have k times ln n, or at most k times ln n many sets in the greedy solution. And with that, we have a, a logarithmic factor more elements in our greedy solution compared to the optimal solution, which was k. Okay. Any questions about set cover and uh, especially the approximation guarantee? Yeah. The first, wait, uh, this one? Yeah. So, if you look at us after a certain iteration, you have, let's say, NT elements left that are not covered. Um, you know that the optimal solution uses K sets. And since it's a feasible solution, it has to cover all elements, including our NT elements that have not been covered yet. Um, and so if these K sets need to cover all these NT elements, there must be one of these sets that covers at least NT uh, divided by K many um, elements. So in the next iteration, it will take the one set. Um, and of course, all the sets in the optimal solution are sets that you can pick. Um, it will pick the set that is covering the largest number of elements. 
So the one that covers the largest number of elements must cover therefore at least that number, namely nt over k many elements. Yep, okay. Any other question? Okay, then I will in this last couple of minutes start um, a new topic if there's no more questions about set cover and in fact about any greedy algorithm. So this is uh, finally closing. So this chapter of, uh, of greedy algorithms. And, and why? So is there, what, what's left really? If we, so we saw these greedy algorithms, they're really powerful, they're really easy, they're really fast. What else could you possibly need? Well, some problems we can't solve greedy. I mean, we have certain conditions, we have formulated certain conditions under which uh, we can guarantee that the greedy algorithm will give us an optimal solution. And the scheme that greedy always works is that it makes a local choice, the one that looks the best at the moment, and then is left with one subproblem that you have to continue solving. And uh, not every subproblem has this kind of structure. So sometimes you have to consider sort of multiple subproblems, try to solve those first, and then make an informed choice among these subproblems sub how to proceed with the original problem. And this is sort of the, the fundamental difference between dynamic programming um, and greedy algorithm. In greedy algorithm, you don't really care. You make your choice, you are left with one subproblem, and, and, and this is basically the end of the story. In dynamic programming, as you will see, um, you will look at multiple subproblems where it will decompose the problem into multiple subproblems um, and uh, try to figure out how to solve the original problem by looking at the solutions of all these subproblems. And um, this allows you to solve a much broader class of problems. So you can solve many problems using dynamic programming that you cannot solve using greedy. Um, but this generality comes at the cost of, uh, of typically a, a, a smaller or a lower efficiency. So typically these algorithms are not as efficient as greedy, but they can solve, as I said, a much broader um, class of, of, of problems. So these are the two next topics really in this class. We will talk about dynamic programming in the book. They call it the sledgehammer of, of, of uh, algorithms. So it's much more powerful than uh, a simple greedy algorithm. Um, it's, as I said, less efficient. And the second uh, really powerful framework to solve a very, very broad class of problems will be linear programming. And, and both these terms don't really refer to programming. These, uh, these are coming from an older times where there was no classical uh, programming. Uh, programming meant more something like a planning. You're planning sort of a, a, a procedure, a, a process, or in this case, an algorithm. And the first uh, such scheme that we are discussing is the dynamic programming. Let me just write down this, these few sentences about dynamic programming as an introduction, and we can uh, stop at this point for today. Dynamic programming. So again, let's contrast this uh, to greedy. So to understand dynamic programming helps a lot to contrast it uh, with, with greedy algorithms. And as we said, in, in greedy methods, uh, you make a greedy choice and you're left with one subproblem. And some problems don't have this, this structure. So in these cases, we have to really um, look at multiple subproblems to, to analyze this. And dynamic programming is sort of the, the framework in which we can do that.
This allows us to solve a much broader class of problems. But generally uh, with less efficiency. The next time we introduced this with a very classical example, and then we'll see how this really works in the actionless dynamic programming scheme. But any questions before we stop here? Yeah. Um, if, if I'm gonna do this, you said? Yeah, but it is very dependent on the problem. So there's not uh, one answer to this. It's not that dynamic programming takes a certain time or space. It depends on, on the specific problem. But we will see this in the, in the, we will go through, I believe, two or three applications of dynamic programming that have different structures and different running times and, and space complexities. Yeah. Okay. And thank you and see you on uh, Tuesday. <laughs>